Welcome again to another edition of State Representative Roger Bruce and his team working to try to make sure that you are informed about all of the issues that take place here at the Capitol during this legislative session. Uh, today we're going to kind of focus on issues related to uh, small business enterprise, trying to make sure that uh, we really talk about House Bill 712, uh, which tries to equalize uh, the procurement process here at, at the Capitol. Uh, I'm going to let you know, our guests today introduce themselves, and then we'll get right into the conversation. Rodney Littles. Uh, Tiffany Stewart Stanley. And I'm Bill Cannon with the Georgia Black Constructors Association. Okay, as you guys know, uh, I dropped the legislation uh, this week uh, for uh, House Bill 712. And I say I dropped it, actually, I pre filed it before the session started, but the process requires that you file it again once the session starts. Uh, it will be assigned to committee uh, tomorrow. And, uh, and then we'll know what the next steps are. But in the meantime, there's been all kinds of discussion about it or, uh, already as a result of the uh, pre-filing of it. And, uh, you know, why don't we tell our listeners what, what you're hearing, you know, what you, uh, the feedback that you're getting about it now right. and anything that you'd like to say about it. Sure. Well, Roger, we really appreciate you taking the lead on this. Uh, we know your background with uh, Maynard Jackson as mayor and his efforts to improve purchasing practices and inclusion of minority firms in government purchasing. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole concern from our community basically is we pay taxes. Uh, the state budget goes to spending a lot of money on both goods and services and construction. And uh, quite frankly, there's, not a, there's a big dis disparity between what is spent with those of the uh, minority community in particular. Yeah. African-American-owned businesses specifically. Talk, talk specifically, because I know you, you had a, a significant uh, role in helping to put the legislation together. Okay. And, you know, people get confused about what the bill is and what the bill isn't. Right. So let's talk about that a little bit. You know, okay. you know obviously, you know, it, it does not create the uh, disparity that we heard about in a, a commute a meet <laughs> right. we just left. Right. Uh, where the argument was that if we if we do this, that we're taking business away from the majority. Right. And uh, in fact, that I think her statement was that the balance has shifted the other direction. Oh. And uh, did I not hear that earlier? Yes. In, in and, DOT. Uh, and, and not even close to, to that. You know, no. so talk about a little bit about what the bill is and what what it isn't from your perspective. OK, well, what the bill would do is create the uh, division of supply diversity in the Office of Administrative Services. The idea would be to uh, conduct a disparity study of all state agencies to determine whether there is a disparity in purchasing with minority women-owned firms. Uh, the State Department of uh, Transportation has just completed their most recent study, but the one that was completed uh, in 2012 clearly indicated that uh, particularly African-American firms are underutilized based upon their availability in the marketplace. Um, the United States Supreme Court in 1989 heard a case, Richmond, the city of Richmond versus Croson Company, in which the outcome of that uh, uh, lawsuit, it was determined that a legal predicate has to be established in order to create goals. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the Georgia DOT program has federal mandates, so right. they have to adhere to those goals. However, the state does not. So all the purchasing beyond the federal dollars that come into DOT do not come under the scrutiny of a disparity program. Right. So we would like to see a disparity study done uh, in order to determine where and if there is a disparity in other state agencies for contracting for goods, services, and commodities. And create the balance. You, you just sat through a, a meeting a moment ago mm -hmm. uh, where one of the representatives, we don't have to mention the name, but one of the representatives mm -hmm. had a, an opinion about this. T what was your reaction to what she said? I felt it was very shocking because I think if you look at the numbers, if you look at the study that was done between 2009 and 2011, you'll see that something along the lines of 2.5% of those contracts with the Georgia Department of Transportation went to African Americans. So I don't understand, unless there's some data that we're missing or I'm missing, where the numbers can come from where you can say that 
minority owned businesses or women owned businesses are taking contracts and money away from um, white male businesses. I mean, I just think the numbers are not there. And, and so you heard the same thing I heard. Yes, I heard the same thing too. It, it was shocking. Yeah, it, it, it shocked me too because I've never heard that statistic before that it was out of balance in the other direction. Um, you you sat through that meeting too, didn't you? Yes, and I heard just what you heard. However, I wasn't shocked. Uh, I'm I'm accustomed to it after all these years of trying to to work with you and others on, on making a difference. Uh, I do understand that everyone sees it from their own perspective. The important number to recognize on that last study that Rodney mentioned is that there was an increase in the definition of women business in, uh, enterprises defined as white women-owned business enterprise. Okay. And when you add the percentage attributed to white women-owned business to white male-owned business, it's 96% of all the dollars spent. Mm. You know, what, one of the things that, that, that I was trying to bring up at that other meeting as well was the, the, the idea that I was trying to find a, a distinction between businesses that are owned by minorities and, and women uh, versus the person that owns the company having to have the, the, the skill set. In, in other words, are we trying to drive the money or the, the, a percentage of the money into businesses owned by women and minorities versus the, that person having to have the skill? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, that's a very good point, Roger. In the industry, we call it men in, in skirts. Okay. Okay. Uh, in a lot of states, the goals for, I mean, excuse me, the composition to be satisfied as a minority women-owned business is 51% ownership. Uh, according to your bill, it requires a demonstration of 70% ownership to be a woman-owned or minority-owned business. Right. And quite a few minority-owned businesses, particularly African American, are 100% owned. Right. So there's no no delusion at all. Exactly. So yes, the, the, what has happened, and I think Bill pointed out very aptly. <laughs> The, the percentage of work at DOT that was going to women, white-owned businesses was higher than their availability in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So they don't have a disparity. Okay, T talk a little bit too, you know, I'm, either one of you, uh, around the types of, you know, because when we, when we say DOT and jobs, people tend to think strictly building roads. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole lot more to it than just building roads. And, 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 and just, I, I was watching them lay out uh, sidewalks in my neighborhood, and, and most people think that all that's involved is, you know, you go dig up the ground and you throw some concrete down there and you smooth it out. But there's a whole lot of other things that go in there. It's piping, it's all kinds of things that happen just to make, a, 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 just to make a, a, a walkway. Mm -hmm. So all of those other jobs, you know, talk a little bit about all the other jobs so that people who are looking at this right. would have some sense for, you know, the kinds of things that they might be able to go to DOT with in terms of their job their, or their company. Correct. Because it's not just building roads. The hard work. Right. Well, there's a whole area of professional services. That there's a design aspect before you even get into going into the ground. Right. So the soft services and engineering and architecture are very, very prevalent and are needed way before you get to the part of actually digging up the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the idea of the bill, uh, HB 712, is to look at purchasing uh, state agencies in goods, commodities, and other non-construction related services. It's not right. just construction related Correct. services. So we would be looking at making an impact in uh, local communities uh, in various industries, not just in construction. Right, and, and we're talking about, you know, things that might be as simple as office supplies. Correct. It, it, it could be cleaning the buildings. Uh, and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to, to, to clean the buildings and to provide, you know, goods and services. So we just want to make sure that as people, you know, if, if you start a business, if you have a business, that you, you look at this in the context of all of the different things that the state purchases. And, it, and it's not, like you said, it's not just construction, there's all kinds of things. Right. And, uh, and, and some of them are long-term repeat contracts, some of them are you know, one-shot deals, but the point is that you really need 
to, to pay attention uh, to all of the aspects of business and see whether or not you can offer your goods and services to the state. There was a, a gentleman there who happened to be from the DOT that, that talked earlier, and because uh, he was mentioning that there's a uh, uh, that they're having difficulty finding vendors for all of the different things, um, and I want to make sure that people, if you have a, a question about this, that you contact my office because we want to help people who want to do business with the state. So uh, you can you can reach me at. Uh, at, at, through, through my website, rogerbruce.net, or you can um, just call down to the, the office here at the Capitol. Um, what other, you know, there were some other things that you um, dealt with today. Why don't we talk a little bit about that? I know one of the big issues that we are dealing with right now is, is cannabis oil and how this is going to impact uh, our communities. And, you know, I'm on record as saying that I'm, I'm real hesitant about it because the cannabis oil comes from the marijuana plant. And if they extract the, the, the oil out of it, I still want to know what they're going to do with the rest of it. You know, what happens to the rest of it? How is it disposed of? Uh, is somebody going to be smoking it? I don't know. And, uh, and I'm, you know, while I, I want to see these children uh, get help mm -hmm. for the issues that they may, may be having, I'm not sure that, a medical, that the medical profession has said that this is the right cure. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, in fact, what I'm hearing from some doctors is that they're concerned that because they don't know how this stuff is going to be grown, uh, what kind of things people are going to be putting in it to preserve it or whatever the case may be, and if they prescribe some kind of uh, other medication for another purpose, how the two interact with each other, and are they going to end up hurting somebody, killing somebody as a result of not knowing what's really in this, this stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what, what, what did you hear this morning? What was your? Well, well at the hearing today, um, Representative um, Alan Peak he spoke, and the basis of his, um, of his um, speech to the committee was determining how we get the product now to Georgia. Um, he, he, I think it was himself and Representative uh, Gravely they both went and toured the dispensary in Minnesota. Um, and they got to see, they actually had pictures for everyone to see of the dispensary. And it just looked like a, like a normal, a, a big pharmacy. It was like a big building. They, had, they showed where you checked in, where you checked out. They actually the, went and they actually went and saw the different, where they grew the marijuana and different things like that. Um, it was, I think he, he kept stressing the fact that this is not going to be, you know, in someone's backyard. This is going to be an actual dispensary um, is the model that they want to use. And he actually said that they looked at s several models, the Colorado model, but the Minnesota model, which is the strictest model, is the one that he would like for Georgia to use. Um, he said that they talked to some law enforcement agencies out in Colorado, and they said that they wish they hadn't have gone as far as they went with the marijuana. Did they say why? Um, no, he just he just said that they wish that they had not gone as far as they Yeah, because I, I talked to some of my colleagues out there, too, and they're saying that they, they've got more people now uh, that they, they appear to be intoxicated off of this stuff constantly and, uh, and, and that they, they, it's not controllable. Mm -hmm. they, they, they say it's not in control and, and that they are having instances of uh, people having uh, automobile accidents and all mm -hmm. kinds of other things that are going on. Uh, because of this. Um, I'm still trying to figure out, you know, because we get a mixture here in Georgia mm -hmm. of people saying uh, that we want, we want to legalize this for the purposes of helping these children. Mm -hmm. But then we also get another group that's mixing the story up saying, well, we, why not just let it be recreational? Mm -hmm. It doesn't do anything, you know, long term to anybody, which I question. I said, if it doesn't do anything to you, then why you want to smoke it? It does something. You know, that's why you want the reaction from it. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess where I'm trying to go with this is, are we opening the door by allowing this product to be grown here and sold here? Are we opening up the door? And I'm just asking the question. You guys, you know, can chime in. Are we opening up the door to other abuses of this product. And I know I hear all the time, well, what about people drinking? Mm -hmm. and I'm like, well, because 
you know, we're doing one bad thing somewhere else, should we do another bad thing because we're doing a bad thing? I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me, but what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think from what I heard in the hearing, I mean, that some of the legislators had concerns about the, your same concerns, and um, they asked, actually, were there any other states who had done the Minnesota model or something very similar to the Minnesota model, model where there's like a longer result? Because Minnesota passed their law back in 2014 and it went into effect in July of 2015. So there's only been about six months go of, of the actual growing the marijuana in the dispensary. So there's like not enough data. Um, there was a, a doctor from Emory who was there and she said that there were really no ways to determine um, you know, what amount of THC would make someone, I guess, high. And so that's kind of one of the issues with determining, you know, what how much marijuana is too much or how much THC or C B C is too much, because there's no way to determine what actually gets you high because it depends on the person. Mm. Your body weight, your body size. So there's no data right now to really, I guess, to address your concerns. Mm -hmm. Where, where do you guys hear? I guess uh, what I've been following about this in terms of the medical side, and I'm not a doctor by any means, but the oil, I'm not aware of any side effects per se, and that it's administered specifically for the ailment. I think your concerns about the recreational use may have some merit, and we prescribe drugs through doctors now from pharmaceutical companies I see them advertising on television, and the side effects are worse than some of the yeah. ailments they're trying yeah. to solve. Exactly. So I would, I would be that, concerned. That, that's called full disclosure in case right. something does happen. Right. So I would be concerned about what the side effects might be if it was my child. Mm -hmm. You know, I would want to know a little bit more about the side effects. But as far as the uh, administering it as a medicine, I mean, we do that now through pharmaceutical companies. and. Yeah, but there's a process that you go through to get drugs approved. Correct. Correct. And, and this group of people is trying to just go all the way around that process. They don't, right. for whatever reason, don't want to go through that process. Right. And, um, and again, I don't want to see, you know, I'd like to help these kids any way we can, but I don't want to create a bigger problem in the process. Have you, you got anything you want to say about it? Well, just. I mean, you, go ahead. You don't want recreational drugs, do you? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I just want to make sure. <laughs> But I, I am concerned about the welfare of the children. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously there's going to be a lot more discussion and more investigation. But uh, if you're a parent and your child is severely impaired by something that you had no earthly idea mm -hmm. uh, what happened to your child. Right. Uh, when my son was born... Uh, he had high blood count and he had uh, several other illnesses. And that, that terrifies a parent when you have a baby and a young child. Uh, at that point, you really want to try whatever can give relief to your child. That's correct. And so there's a, there's, there is needed a, some type of balance. Obviously, some more investigation uh, will be appropriate. Uh, but we also have to um, keep these parents and these children in mind as we continue this discussion. Yeah, and that's what makes it difficult. You know, you know they've been bringing the kids down here to the Capitol in wheelchairs, and some of these kids have had seizures right here in the building. And, um, and, and you know, I think that's kind of cruel myself, but the, the, re the reality is that I understand that they need help. Um, but you want to make sure that the help we give them is, is long-term help and not short-term that leads to a long-term worse problem. Um, and I'm not sure exactly where that, that balance is. And that's why, I, I, me personally, I think that that's why we ought to let the doctors and the professionals, you know, go through the process that they go through to evaluate how these medicines impact people and, uh, and, and then make recommendations on that basis. Um, and I know that there are people who are saying, well, I don't want my child to have to wait until all of that happens. And, uh, and I understand that. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what the solution is. I'm just not sure that this is it. And, uh, but anyway, any other things that you guys want to, any other topics, anything else that you want to talk about? Want to talk about the civil rights agenda? Uh, yes, the, um, for those of you that may not know, the, the term civil rights was coined by Dr. King. Silver. 
S I L V E R. Okay. Uh, that uh, during the final stages, just before the Civil Rights Act was passed, he realized that there was a need to address economic injustice. And so, with that, he said that we got to launch a civil rights movement as the companion to the civil rights movement. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to address now. I'm disappointed that many of his followers didn't pick up the baton that he dropped as he was assassinated uh, almost 50 years ago. And so here we are still trying to uh, follow our leader uh, in picking up that baton and addressing things, especially in our government. It was, and I'll end with this, uh, we talked a good bit about the Department of Transportation, but the only reason that we have that program is because the federal government uh, requires it. Uh, DOT does not have its own program. At one time it did, but the, vote, the board voted it down and eliminated it. But when I was on the commission uh, for the House of Representatives on minority business participation, uh, it showed uh, some substantial problems, and that was followed by Governor Zell Miller's executive order requiring all state agencies to identify what their participation levels were. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing how low that there, there was a plethora of zeros, mm -hmm. zero participation, one percent participation, half a percent participation. Uh, and even amongst our historically black colleges and universities was very disappointing. Right. And so there's a lot of work to be done there, and I believe this bill will not just address the Georgia Department of Transportation. It will address where it, it, all of right. our tax dollars go, it, that's, that's all correct. of these different departments that do a lot of different things, including our authorities like Stone Mountain. Right. Well, that's, that, and that is the intent of, uh, of House Bill 712, which is to expand what the DOT has started across all state department lines. Did you have something else you wanted to say? No. <laughs> Do we catch you off guard with that? No, we catch you off guard, but I just think in, in reading bills seven, House Bill 712 and actually uh, just doing some research on it, it just definitely seems like there's something, it's something that needs to be passed and it's something mm -hmm. that we need um, as a female uh, black business owner. I mean, just seeing the disparity is just, it's shocking and it's just something that needs to be addressed. Are, are you finding as, as, cause I know you've been walking around trying to, you know, drum up support for it. Mm -hmm. Are you finding any patterns in with what's going on? The, the only thing that I, that I hear from, from a few that I've, I, the consistency I see is we're adding another layer of government, um, is a concern. And then the concern about, well, what if you can't find any you know, black businesses, then what do you do? Then that creates a whole nother issue um, because now you can't give the contract to a non-minority or women-owned business. So that's, you know, I've explained that's where the disparity study comes in and then you also have the register. There'll be a register in the bill that will help. You'll have this register of people that you can go to for these types of, um, you know, products or business mm -hmm. or whatever you need. So I think if once they read the bill and they get a better understanding of it, I think the more people will support it. It sounds like you chomping at the pits to say something about that. Yes. Well, um, I'm originally from uh, the Northeast, and the problems that I see here are really not much different than the Northeast. Mm -hmm. The difference is that you have executive level support for a program. It is instituted in law. But those that don't want to follow find ways around it. Mm -hmm. That's why your 70% minimum is a good idea. Right. But the bottom line is um, there's a sense of privilege and entitlement that majority firms have, particularly in the construction industry, and don't see the need to uh, p uh, permit others to participate from the minority community. And so we have what's what I would call an economic slavery issue, mm. whereby we're we're being kept down economically because of this prejudice. And we can't hire folks, we can't train them, we can't reduce the dependency on public service programs without having economic growth in our communities. Right. Well, you know, I've been a advocating, you know, for as long as you've known me, yes, uh, to change the, the message that we give to our children when they come into the world. Uh, you know, we have all been probably indoctrinated by our parents with go to school, get a good education so that you could go beg somebody for a job. Mm. They didn't say it that way, but that's what it amounted to. Yes. 
and and that's what you did. You went to school, you got the, the education, you you went out, you got a job, you worked and gave that job the best years of your life. Right. You know, for the most part, you know, you worked through your your, your late twenties, your your thirties, into your forties, and then the company comes along and says, okay, well, we don't have any use for you anymore. Right. So yeah. now we got to lay you off because we're going in a different direction. We're doing something, and, and, but you've now given away the best years of your life. That's right. So. I want to change that message. I still want you to go to school. I still want you to get a good education. But I want you to use that to go out and create your own jobs, create your own businesses, create your own opportunities for your own success. Right. And, uh, and, and, and that's the message that I think that we have to start pushing people towards. And, and, and last thing I want to say before I pass it over to Bill, recently there was a, a study done and a report done where there are 100 Americans, white Americans, that control more wealth than the entire African American population yeah. in this country. One hundred people. Yeah, there's a there's a uh, TV. If you go on the History Channel, there's a, a a a story on there. It's called "The Men Who Built America," mm -hmm. uh, and it talks about the, it was basically five guys that that had ninety percent of the wealth in the country mm -hmm. um, back during the Vanderbilts and and the Rockefellers and all those guys. It was like five Duponts. of them. Duponts. DuPonts, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, but they controlled everything. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and monopolies were not illegal back then. You know, they are, supposedly they are now, but you know, we know what reality is. But we just have to figure out how do we take the American dream, so to speak, and allow it to be everybody's dream and not just a dream of a handful of people. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a very interesting point. But your point about the education process, Reminds me of my alma mater, Hampton. We have an entrepreneurship program. Mm -hmm. You can graduate with an entrepreneurial degree. When that program was first initiated, it, it, the, I guess because it was not thoroughly vetted, when they graduated those with this degree, they didn't have anywhere to go. Mm -hmm. They couldn't get a job because they had a degree in entrepreneurship, which says to a business, well, you're just going to use us so that you can start your own business. So we're not going to invest in, in your creating a business that may compete with ours. Mm. So that was something that had to be re-engineered. But what used to happen was our young people went to college, came back to the family business that was already in our right. community, which is the other part of civil rights is the African-American community reinvesting in the African-American community so that that dollar is recycled so that we can help support our, our, our HBCUs like Morehouse, Hampton, and others. Right. All right, guys, I think that might wrap it up for today. Um, I appreciate you guys coming out um, and, and spending the time with us this week. And uh, we're going to come back again next week. We'll talk about the bill. Uh, it has been dropped, as I said, now in the House. Uh, it'll be assigned to committee tomorrow. Uh, we'll know by next week what committee it's in, and we encourage people to come down and support it uh, because I think everybody benefits from it. This is not a you know give business to minority company bill. It is let's get everybody that's involved in this process that lives in this state give everybody equal opportunity to participate in the in the in the things that the state has to offer. I think that's a better way to, to, to put it. Uh, so again, thank you for, for coming out. Uh, look forward to continuing working with you guys, and uh, let's, let's make Georgia a better place for everybody. Amen.